So let's pray. Holy Spirit, thank you for what you're doing today. And we just release your spirit in the room. We pray, God, for your, your manifest presence to go to just teach us. And, and uh, Lord, just expose us to new ways of thinking. Um, I pray against mental blocks. I pray against stifled thinking and small thinking. Lord, I release us to the mind of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, um, I thought I'd kind of do part two of, of um, the me I hardly know and, um, and, and talk a little bit about uh, the mind of Christ and, and what God's given us. <laughs> you know, Jesus said, love your neighbor, help me, as you love yourself. All of us need a big ass. <laughs> Just turn to your neighbor and say, you need a big ass. Because how many of you know, <laughs> you, can't love your, you can't love your neighbor <laughs> as, I said as. You can't love your neighbor if you don't love yourself. Are you, are you listening? The best thing you could do for your neighbor is to love you. You know, in fact, Paul goes on to talk to men about their wives, and he says, in fact, it's my 43rd anniversary today. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're out there somewhere. Um, I forgot what I was saying now. Oh, yes, no. Husbands, love your wives as you love your own flesh. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourished and cherishes it. My point is, is that the best thing I can do for Kathy is to first love me. For, the best thing you can do for your neighbor is to first love yourself. Help me understand that if you don't love you, you won't love them. And so there, there's this whole thing, and we talked yesterday a little bit about false humility. Thinking bad about yourself is not called humility. That's called the spirit of stupid. <laughs> humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's just thinking of yourself less. How many understand that when you feel bad about yourself, you're still the center of attention because you're still thinking about you? And so there's this whole idea about how we should think about ourselves. I remember years ago... I was, uh, when Kathy and I first came to uh, Bethel Church, we'd sold our business to a multi-billion uh, dollar company, and um, when we got to, to uh, when we actually came on staff, the, the month after we came on staff, the company that bought us, who had yet to pay us, actually went bankrupt. And so we lost everything. We lost our house, we lost everything but our two cars and our furniture. And so it was a very tight time, and not only did we lose the uh, sale of our, of, our, of our business, but we also owed $1.8 million. So it was really a tight time. So um, we went to the elders and we said to the elders, we, you know, we're gonna have to go back into business because when we came on staff here, we, didn't, we, we, did, we came on for free for the first year, we worked for free. And year two, we worked for $1,000 each. So like paying back $1.8 million was probably gonna take, but we figured it out about 400 years. <laughs> and so we, we met with Bill Johnson and we said, you know, we, we can't stay. Like, we have to go back to work because, you know, we're, we're, we, we thought we'd have a quarter of a million dollars to live on and now we have nothing. And so we met with the elders and the elders said to us, you know, would you please not bankrupt for six months and so that we could pray for a miracle. And I said in that meeting, I said, I, know, I feel like I haven't told the story for a while. I feel like it's for somebody in here. I said to the elders, you know, I don't have faith for that. And one of the elders, uh, he's been here forever. In fact, he's been here now for 53 years. He stood up, and he, he's a very quiet man, and he said, would you trust my faith? So I, so I said, sure, for six months, I mean, what do I got to lose? I already owe the money, sure. So anyway, they began to pray for, they prayed for Kathy and I that, in that meeting, and I left that meeting, and a, a little kind of cool story is, 30 days later, I got forgiven 900,000. Still owed 900, but I got forgiven half of it. And over the next three years, the Lord just did miracle after miracle, and we, we paid or negotiated down all, got forgiven or negotiated down all of the, the, the debt and paid it all off. But in the midst of that, a man, one day, I walked into the prayer house. Actually, we didn't have a prayer house at the time. We were, we were in a prayer room. 
I was about 20 minutes late, and Bill was in there with about 30, 40, 50 people, and they were all praying. It was on a Friday night, and I walked in, and uh, Bill handed me an envelope, and I put it in my pocket, and he said, I think you should look at it. So I opened the envelope up, and it was a check for $3,000. You know, have you ever been in a season where $3,000 feels like $3 million? Well, I ruined the prayer meeting. I started shouting, someone gave me $3,000, someone gave me $3,000, and Bill said, you better look again, and I looked down, and it was $30,000. Someone had given me $30,000. I freaked out. I was running around the room, speaking in other tongues, <laughs> some Egyptian, some Holy Spirit tongues. I was super excited, and, and, and then, um, you know, we had enough money to to buy the man, his name was Eli, to buy Eli a card, a really nice card, and, you know, it was, it was all good. And then for what, but what but happened next is kind of strange. You know, um, the lowest level of life is you're unconsciously ignorant. It means you don't know that you don't know. The next level of life is you know you don't know. Well, for the next six months, I avoided Eli. Like if Eli would come in those doors, I would go all the way around and come in those doors. And this one, the weird thing is, I didn't have any idea I was doing it. It was below the conscious level. One Sunday morning, Bill was preaching, and this is when we just had one service, and he was kind of going on, and you know, in conclusion, in conclusion kind of thing, and I was like, I gotta go to the bathroom so bad. And in conclusion, I finally like, I can't wait any longer, and I ran out those double doors, and into the bathroom, and didn't know if I was going to make it. And when I opened the door, Eli was there. And his back was to me. So I slammed the door, and I took off running all the way to those bathrooms. And, and, and on the way there, I had this thought, something's wrong with me. <laughs> you know, how many know that adversity introduces a man to himself? And I just got introduced to myself. I went to bed that night, and as you probably can imagine, I couldn't sleep. All night long, I was thinking, have you ever thought yourself into a corner? Like, you just think, 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 and think, and like, you argue it all out in your mind, and it's like, he's going to say this, then I'm going to say that. You always win, right? <laughs> it was probably 4 o'clock, no, it was probably 5 o'clock in the morning. I remember the sun rising, and I, and I finally had this thought, maybe I should pray about it. <laughs> it's pretty bad when you get paid to pray, you know? And so, I said to the Lord, Lord, I think there's something wrong with me. He said, "Uh uh-huh. I said, do you know what it is? (laughs) You know know you're lost when, (laughs) it's like when Adam said, when God said to Adam, Adam, where are you? You know, if God can't find you, you're really lost. (laughs) So I said, do you know, do you know what it is? And he said, "Uh uh-huh. I said, will you tell me? He said, do you really want to know? He asked me, do you really want to know? And, and you know, how many know denial is a beautiful thing? I laid there for several minutes wondering if I really wanted to know. And finally I said, yes, I really want to know. And he said this to me. He said, Eli gave you $30,000. I said, well, I know that. He said, well, the problem is that that you don't love yourself $30,000 worth. And you're afraid that if Eli gets to know you, he'll be sorry he gave you the money. I laid there for many minutes, tears rushing down my face. And I said to God, what do I do? He said, why don't you try this? I said, all right, I'm ready. He said, why don't you try loving your, yourself the way I love you? Because if you loved you the way I love you, you would ne- never be afraid of Eli not loving you. And I began to realize that I've spent my whole life building cases against people because I, I realized that night and into the morning that you'll never let someone love you more than you love you. And when someone tries to love you more than you love you, you will build a case against them. The more you want someone to love you, the greater fear you'll have of them loving you if you don't love yourself. And you begin to reject them before they could reject you. I have a a really good prophetic gift, and I would use my prophetic gift to find dirt on people Not that I would share with them, but so that I could reassure myself, I don't really want to be friends with that person. I would tell my wife, who you know have been married 43 years, I would tell my wife, this is a common statement 
in our average week that probably happen three times a week. I would say, we'd meet someone and I'd say, at home, they didn't like me. She'd say, well, honey, how do you know that they didn't like you? I'd say, I could, I could, I could discern it. They didn't like me. You know, how many understand that if people, if some people don't like you, how many know that's not your problem? But if everyone doesn't like you, that probably has little to do with them and everything to do with you. Not everyone's going to like you. But if nobody likes you, it's probably because you don't like you. And I realized that night... in bed, that the problem wasn't that people didn't like me, the problem was that I didn't like me. And the truth is, I never knew I didn't like me until someone liked me more than I liked me. I realized growing up, because my dads didn't like me, that I grew up thinking, there must be something wrong with me if my own fathers don't like me. There's a thing Danny teaches that I found to be very profound. He says, intimacy means into me, you see. And I've watched a pattern over the years. I've watched people date. Here's one example. I watched them date. And by the way, if you're not supposed to marry, please don't be offended. Don't marry. It's awesome. You don't want to have sex? It's fine with God. Fine with me. But let me be clear, that would not be me. (laughs) Sex is good. God made it, said be fruitful, multiply, then he said it's very good. And I say that to my wife all the time. It's very good. (laughs) I say to my wife all the time, we should be fruitful and multiply. I even tried reading her Song of Solomon. Your neck... Is like a tower. <laughs> Your belly button is like a goblet full of sweet wine. And your breasts are like twin fawns. This is, this is a quote of the Bible. I know. (laughs) And then I said, I think I should climb the palm tree. And that about then, all I remember is uh, that ain't happening. Let me see you get down on one knee and propose to me again. What's that? Let me see you get down on one knee and propose to me again. I don't think I got on one knee the first time I proposed to you. I'm just wondering if you could get up off one knee. (laughs) (laughs) Love you, honey. I was 15 when I proposed to you the first time. That's true. Yeah. make my heart beat fast. I thought I was having a panic attack, but then I saw that you were near. (laughs) I'm working it right now. How many of you are not married? Okay, that's some really good lessons for you right here. Intimacy. I've watched this I've watched this process when I've been the leader of school ministry for 20 years. I love to see people get married. And again, on a serious note, if you're not supposed to get married, don't get married. But I've watched people that they quote, I can't find the right person. I mean, how how many of you know there's like freaking 7.4 billion people on the planet? (laughs) I know you're out there somewhere, (laughs) somewhere, somewhere. You know, I'm 80. I don't know you're out there somewhere. (laughs) I mean, get a life. And I watch people do this this thing. 
I watched them like they, I don't know what you call it, like do coffee. I don't know. They change the lyric. You know. They change the song all the time. Like, we don't believe in dating. Like, whatever it is where you talk about doing life together and having children. Whatever you call that, you know, whatever that is. And, the, and, the, and the, you know, they date. And then, and then it goes on for, you know, months. And I've watched this pattern. And then, and then we begin to get intimate. I'm not talking about sex. I'm talking about into me, you see. And when that couple begins to get intimate, suddenly... How many of you know love covers a multitude of sins, but fear reveals irrational thoughts? Fear reveals irrational thoughts. And all of a sudden, this couple, this woman or this man, they begin to build a case against them. And then it's off to the next man or the next woman. And, and, I, and because I'm old, because I was a youth pastor, because, I got to, because I've got to watch people's 20-year journey, I see the same person, maybe the same gal, maybe the same guy, and they, there they go along. And I say to myself, it takes about six months for her to decide that he can see into her, and now she's going to begin to sabotage their relationship. And pretty soon, she's in my office or talking to me, in between a class saying, you know, I, I just see this thing on him, and, I, and somehow I have to convince her that the problem isn't him, the problem is her. That you are afraid that he's going to see in you what you think you see in you. And these people spend their whole lives looking for someone who's perfect, And by the way, if they found them, that would be the very person they would never marry. They would never marry someone perfect. And guess what other people do? They marry someone broken so they can feel okay with them because they feel broken. So broken people tend to marry broken people. See, you not loving you is a bad plan. Obviously. See, you teach people how to treat you by the way you treat you. Think about it this way as a metaphor. If I went over your house and, you know, there was crap everywhere, junk cars in the front yard, windows knocked out, I walk in your house and there's beer cans everywhere, I may not put my feet up on my table at home, but I bet I would on yours. You know why? You told me how to treat you. But if you came from your house and you came over my house, and my, you know, I didn't live in a mansion or a palace, but uh, you know, the place was clean and neat and nice, you might put your feet up on your coffee table, but I bet you wouldn't on mine. You know why? Because I told you how to treat me by the way I treat me. See, if people always disrespect you, that's probably not about them, it's probably about you. Have you ever been around somebody who has... Well, let's say, well, how should I say this? Have you ever been around a person that you meet for 20 seconds and you just like them? Like you like them. You're just like, I don't know, I just think I could be their friend forever. And you immediately trust them like they could sell you anything. <laughs> Have you ever been around people like that? Have you ever been around people who you met for 20 seconds and they didn't say a thing, but you didn't like them? I mean, they could look good on the outside, they could be a beautiful looking person, but you meet them, and for whatever reason, you want to not, you, you don't want them in your life. Like you find your inner man rejecting them. You know why that is? Because the first man loved himself, and because he loves himself, or she loves herself, you think in yourself, like sub, below the conscious level, you think there must be something good about this person because of the way they behave towards themselves. They might be overweight. They might not be beautiful. Have you ever met someone who doesn't have the outside trappings of a beautiful person, but they love themselves? And you're like, there's something attractive about a person who actually is fully alive, like we saw yesterday, that, that, that young girl singing. There's something about when you come to grips with you. Listen, listen, you're not perfect. It, it, it's okay. It's okay that you're... Not perfect. Just be okay with who you are. Well, I'm too fat. 
So just be a happy fat person. <laughs> It's worked for me. I'm too skinny. Just, just listen, stop telling yourself that you're not enough. Okay, the person sitting next to you who, who you think is amazing also has things that they don't like about themselves. I don't like my nose. I don't like my hair. I don't like my butt. There's always something I don't like. It's just get over yourself. I am trying. <laughs> But you teach people how to treat you by the way you treat you. If you don't treat yourself well, if your inner world doesn't, if you don't believe in yourself and your inner world, you will send that message to people. There is a message, that, there is an unspoken message. I mean, you can stand straight. It's not, it's, not face, it's not just facial expression. It's not words. There is something that emanates from you that says, I'm lovely, I'm beautiful. You would like me if you got to know me. Or, listen, you don't want to know me. There's something wrong with me. I'm broken. There's 40 reasons why you shouldn't like me. You don't have to even say it. You are carrying it around with you. There's something about learning to love ourselves. I remember uh, my grandkids again. I love to tell stories about my grandkids, especially when they were younger. I, I love grandkids so much better than kids. I would just have had grandkids if I could have. <laughs> I remember one day I, I walked in the front room and And Elijah, I think Elijah was about six or seven, and his, his cousin Isaac was in the room. I told you about Elijah yesterday. And, and as I walked in the room, Elijah said to Isaac, let's fight. And Isaac said, okay. And Elijah said, I'm Spider-Man. Hits him with the web. And Isaac said, I want to be Spider-Man. He says, you can't be Spider-Man, but you can be Superman. He said, all right, I'll be the Superman. And there they were, two superheroes. In the front room. All of a sudden, Riley walked in. Riley's four. Riley looks like a blonde Brillo pad. <laughs> like Cousin It. Like you have to move her hair to see where she's going. She walks in and she says, I want to play. I want to play. I want to be the Spider Man. And Elijah, her older brother, goes, You cannot be Spider Man. Just then I walk by and she says, Papa, Papa. She's crying. I pick her up. What's wrong, Riley? She says, They're not cheering. They're not sharing. They're not sharing. I said, what's wrong? I love to be the Spider-Man. wanted that me. I said, why don't you be Wonder Woman? Wonder Woman can whip Spider-Man any day. How many men are married? You understand this deep revelation. She said, all right, I'd be the, I, I, I'd be the Wonder Woman. I let, him down, let her down the firm. And there they were, three superheroes. I walked out of that room and I had this thought, ain't no one asking to be the garbage man. It takes about 12 years of religion to convince you that being a loser is somehow spiritual. Because when you were little, you knew you were born to be amazing. Any child, I've been all over the world, Africa, in the, in, in the villages of Africa, in the orphanages of Africa. I remember I was in Africa a few years ago and there was 500 kids in, a, in an orphanage that I helped to fund. And I was walking along, and the kids were surrounding us, Kathy and I, and, and a bunch of my, my own kids. And, and I was saying to the kids, what do you want to be? And, she, and the girl says, I want to be a judge. And, and, the, and the young man, the young boy, he was probably 10, he said, I want to be a prophet. And someone else said, I want to be a preacher. And so I, I want to be the mayor as we were walking along. And I'm like, even, even there in an orphanage where mom and dad are both dead, no one said, I want to be a drug addict. I think I'll be a loser. I'm simply saying that religion convinces us that somehow being a loser is somehow spiritual. You know, Jesus, Peter, and James, and the Apostle Paul all use this statement in some form. If you humble yourself, you'll be exalted. Some of you are like, oh, I don't know that verse. If you humble yourself, you'll be exalted. James said, if you humble yourself, you'll be exalted at the proper time. How many understand that there's two sides of this coin? You humble yourself and you get exalted. Why is it that we can be humbled in church, but we can't be exalted? Like, isn't it weird that you can come to church 
and be humbled, but if you, if you get exalted, you're asked to leave. And I'm saying, what would happen if we created a culture where you can come in low and become amazing? Instead of, instead of famous people coming to church, that famous people come from the church. That when someone famous walks in the room, we don't like, oh, can I have a selfie with you? Oh, can you sign my, sign my lips? I'll never wash again. <laughs> we act like a bunch of freaking paupers because we don't realize that we are royal people. Well, that person's famous. How many know you're famous in heaven? The Father has written your name on the palms of his hands. You know, Jesus was crucified at a place called Golgotha. It means the skull. You know why Jesus was crucified at Golgotha? Because Jesus is what? The head of the church. That's why he was crucified on a mountain called the skull. Do you remember that Jesus wore a crown of what? Thorns. Do you know why Jesus wore a crown of thorns? Because salvation wasn't just for humans. Salvation, Jesus said, preach this gospel to every creature. Remember when Adam and Eve fell in the garden? They ate the tree they shouldn't have eaten? Some of you were like, no, you should read this book. This is a very good book. <laughs> and the curse over the serpent was, you're going to crawl on the ground and eat dust, and I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. And it's in the Hebrew, it says, and she will, it, no, it says he, speaking of uh, probably Jesus, it says, and he will stomp you so hard, it will crush your head and bruise his heel. That was the curse over the serpent. And by the way, did you notice the curse over the serpent was the woman will, have, will be eternally angry with you? That was not the curse over, this, over the woman. It was the curse over, did I say the woman? I'm sorry. The curse over the serpent was I'm going to make women internally angry with you do you notice why every time you call for intercessors in any church it's 80 percent women do you notice that every in every culture every culture and every religion figures out some way to reduce women you know why because if the woman gets her rightful place she's the one that carries the enmity the hostility towards the devil it is your job ladies to teach your children to hate the devil. The curse over uh, the, the woman was that you're going to have pain, increased pain in childbirth and your desire will be for your husband, but he will rule you. And by the way, did you notice that only the woman was only ruled in marriage? Under the curse. Under the curse. He said, your desire will be for your husband and yet he will rule you. It wasn't all men will rule all women. It was that when you marry, your husband will rule you. And by the way, that was the curse. I propose that when Jesus died on the cross, he broke the curse. Isn't it interesting that man was formed from dirt, but woman was fashioned from a second generation creation from a rib. Just thought I'd mention that. That was your chance, ladies, to go, woohoo. Might be good for us to remember that she wasn't taken from his foot. But, ladies, it might be good for you to remember that she wasn't taken from his head. She was taken from his side. She was meant to stand beside him. Anyway, I need to keep going. So, but do you remember? So, do you remember the curse? Over, that was the curse over the woman. What was the curse over Adam? You shall till the ground, and it shall yield thorns and thistles. How many of you understand that when God cursed Adam, Eve, and the serpent, that creation was a part of the curse? Why did Jesus wear a crown of, thron a crown of thorns on his head? Because he was crucified to break the curse off of creation. When Jesus uh, was crucified, he was put into the tomb. <laughs> And Peter and John ran to the tomb, and John got there first. <laughs> so this is John 20. And Peter, and John stops at the opening, and Peter runs right in, which we'd expect. 
and he sees two linen wrappings. The linen wrapping that once covered the head of Jesus was taken and put in another place. But the linen wrapping that once covered the body was still in the place where the body once laid. Do you know why? Because when Jesus rose from the dead, the head was revealed. But the body has yet to be revealed. Now let me read you a verse. Romans 8 says, Some of you are like, oh, he still uses paper. <laughs> Verse 14, for all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry, Abba, or Daddy, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if we are children, and if we are children, Heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ Jesus, if indeed we have suffered with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that's about to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For creation was subjected to fertility that willingly, that because of him who subjected in hope, that creation itself would be free from slavery to corruption into the freedom, listen to this, into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Do you know what that says? It says the devil knows who you are. Creation knows who you are. The angels know who you are. And God knows who you are. It's only you who don't know who you are. And all of creation, see, when Jesus rose from the dead, the head was revealed, but the body has yet to be revealed. But how many understand that creation stands, creation is still in a place of corruption until when? Until the sons of God are revealed in glory. So that when you rise to your rightful place in glory, creation is released from corruption into the glory of the children of God. You demeaning you is keeping creation in corruption when it's been assigned to glory. Are you with me? So when Jesus rose from the dead, how many know that you rose with him? That's a good word. In, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul writes, Yet we do speak of wisdom among those who are mature. A wisdom, however, not of this age or the rulers of this age who are passed away. But we speak of God's wisdom in a mystery. But as is written, verse 9, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard, which have not entered to the heart of man, that God has prepared for all those who love him. For, for all those who love him. People say this all the time. Things eye hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard, that hasn't entered in my heart, God has planned for those who love him. I'd like to propose to you that that verse isn't about you. That that verse is actually an Old Testament verse that Paul, in fact, it should be italicized in your Bible, that Paul took from the Old Testament, and the Old Testament prophet, and the Old Testament prophet said, I hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard, it hasn't entered our heart, all that God wants to do for those he loves. Look at the next verse. But to us, God has revealed them through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of men except for the Spirit of him which is in him. By the way, let me stop and say this. The devil doesn't know your thoughts unless he gives them to you. People ask all the time, can the devil read my mind? No, the Bible says right here that nobody knows your thoughts except for you. Um, even so, the thoughts of God, nobody knows except for the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who's from God, so that we may receive freely, so that we may know freely the things given to us by God which things we also speak, not in words taught with human wisdom, but those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual world, words. Now the natural man does not accept the, the Spirit of God, the things that, ah, but the natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, for he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual appraises all things. 
yet he himself is appraised by no one. Look at this, verse 16, which is italicized. Who knows the mind of the Lord that we may instruct him? And Paul writes, we have the mind of Christ. The Old Testament people, how many know they weren't born again? When you receive Jesus Christ, you were born again. I told you yesterday, you are a new creation. You are a, a second generation creation. You are the first beings on planet earth that live both in heaven and on earth are you with me how many know you live in heaven and on earth you currently already in heaven you are seated in heavenly places with christ how many know when that goes from a a philosophy and a theology to a reality it'll change your destiny i am currently seated in heaven the point is do i live from heaven towards earth or do i live from earth towards heaven Do I live from heaven towards earth, or do I live live from earth towards heaven? How many understand that if I live from earth towards heaven, I'm always living in reaction to something that's already happened? I'm praying for people who are sick. How many know they're already sick? I'm praying for something that already happened. Are you with me? But when I pray from heaven towards earth, my heavenly seat gives me eternal perspectives. You remember Apostle John? Jesus said to the Apostle John in Revelation 4, come up here and I'll show you what must take place after these things. How many know your eternal, your, your, your heavenly seat gives you eternal perspective so you see these things, not as they are, but as they should be. And your prayers become prophecy and your words become worlds. So no longer am I just praying to God, but now I'm praying with God. How do you know prophecy is foretelling, I'm telling you the truth, and foretelling, I'm causing the truth. How many of you know, prophecy is foretelling, I'm telling you the future, and foretelling, I'm causing the future. Do you remember Ezekiel's bones? Ezekiel goes to a boneyard where there was once a battle, and there's all these bones, and God says to Ezekiel, can these bones live? And Ezekiel's thinking, hmm, not likely. But when God asks you a question, he probably has a different answer. And Ezekiel says, you know, Lord. And God says, prophesy to the bones. How many of you know he didn't prophesy about the bones? He prophesied to the bones. And as he prophesied, the bones became a mighty army. How many understand? Is that, is that me? Sorry. How many understand that our heavenly seat gives us eternal perspectives? And we began to, when we began to pray from our heavenly seat, our prayers become prophecy and our words become worlds. No longer are we under the circumstances. How many understand we are controlling the circumstances? So the Old Testament prophet says, who knows the mind of God that we can instruct him? And Paul says, we do. How many know that John the Baptist was the greatest prophet of the Old Testament? But Jesus said, the least in the kingdom was greater than John. So that means that John was greater than Daniel, he was greater than Moses, he was greater than Joseph, he was greater than David. But how many understand that the least in the kingdom of God is greater than John? Listen, have you ever heard like, God wants to use little old you? God wants to use little people. God wants to use nameless and faceless people. I'd propose God doesn't have little people. God doesn't have nameless and faceless people. God only has sons and daughters. Oh, gosh. I don't think you're getting this this morning. I'm saying that God doesn't have nameless and faceless people. God only has sons and daughters. Sometimes we prophesy out of our low identity. And we're like, we're trying to say, God wants to use everybody. But in order to say God wants to use everybody, we reduce the prophecy to, make every, to include everybody instead of tell everyone, you're better than that. You're bigger than that. You were created to be sons and daughters of the king. You're actually heirs to the throne. Your daddy is God. And you have the mind of Christ. People come all the time, they're like, I, I, I just want to know who I'm supposed to marry. I go, what are you thinking? I'm thinking, I'd like to know who I'm supposed to marry. Well, aren't you dating Mary? Yeah. Mary from the school of ministry? Two years in school of ministry? Yeah. Mary, who's beautiful? She came from halfway across the world to come here because she was seeking God? Yeah. I just want to know if I'm supposed to marry her. What are you thinking? I'm thinking, what does God want me to do? No, no, you're not understanding. 
what you're thinking is what he's thinking. Because you think like God. You have the mind of Christ. I don't know what the will of God is. What are you thinking? When you're right with God, you think like God. Let me say that again. When you're right with God, you think like God. How many understand that Jesus lives inside of you? People say stupid things like, without God, I could do nothing. Well, that's true, but you're never without him because he'll never leave you or forsake you. That means you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you because that verse wasn't for you. Jesus in John, in John 15 said, you know, that you are, I'm the vine, you're the branches, and you can do nothing without me. But how many of you know, they weren't born again, and you are born again. They became born again, but how many you understand, you don't have to worry about not doing anything without Jesus, because he's always with you. He's never going to leave you or forsake you, which is why you should be doing miracles. Are you with me? I want to finish with this story. In the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel 9, there's a young man named Saul, and his father has lost his donkeys. And he sends Saul and a servant out to find those donkeys. And they look and look and look, and they can't find the donkeys. And the servant says to, 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 his, to Saul, you know, I think there's a prophet up here at the next place, this next village, Maybe he'll know where our donkeys are. And so, isn't it funny that the number two guy always knows more than the number one guy? I don't know how that works. But anyway, <laughs> in the meantime, the Lord speaks to Samuel, the prophet. And he said, hey, there's two young men coming. They'll be here later on this evening, and they're looking for donkeys. And you're going to tell them that their donkeys have been found, but you're going to anoint him king. Well, a little while later, they end up at the prophet's house, and they don't know it's the prophet's house. And they say to, and, the, and Saul says to Samuel, um, we're looking for the prophet. And Samuel says to him, I am the prophet. I want you to stay with me for tomorrow morning. Everybody say, tomorrow morning. From no- tomorrow morning, I'm going to tell you all that's in your heart. For aren't you the one that all of Israel is waiting on? And Saul says, I have no idea why you're talking to me like this. For I'm from the smallest family in the smallest tribe. Now, let me just put this in perspective for a second. Saul is actually has a father who's the most famous warrior at the time in Israel's history. His dad is actually famous. So he may be from a small family in a small tribe, but he's from a famous family in a famous tribe. <laughs> Am I speaking to anyone yet? And remember, the prophet said, tomorrow morning, I'm going to tell you what's already in your heart. Now, chapter 10, verse 1, I'm going to read you a a few passages. It's morning. Then Samuel took the flask of oil and poured it on Saul's head and kissed him and said, Has not the Lord anointed you as ruler over his inheritance? When you go down from me today, then you will find two men close to Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin at Zillag. And they will say to you, your donkeys, which you went to look for, have been found. Now behold, your father has ceased to be concerned about the donkeys, and he's anxious for you, saying, what shall I do about my son? Verse 3, then you will go further from there, and you will come down to the oak of Tabar, and there will be three men going up to God at Bethel. Did you notice where they were going? They were going to Bethel. And they will meet you, one carrying three goats, that's Brian, One carrying three loaves of bread, that's Chris. And one carrying a jug of wine, that'd be Bill. (laughs) And they will greet you, and they will give you two loaves of bread, and you'll accept them in your hand. Afterwards, you will come to the hill hill of God, where the Philistine garrison is. And it shall be that as soon as you've come to that city, that you'll meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place with harps and tambourines and flutes and lyres. Before them, they'll be prophesying. Then the Spirit of the Lord God will come upon you mightily, and you will prophesy with them, and you'll be changed into another man. And it goes on to say that when Saul encountered the prophets, he was changed into another man. 
Now I want to give you a prophecy. See, did you notice that Samuel gave the right word to the wrong man? Remember, he anointed him king, and he said, first of all, he said, I'm going to tell you all that's in your heart. I'd like to say that prophecy reveals the secrets of your heart, and the secrets of your heart are not sin. They're the glory you fell short of. Did you notice that even though Samuel said, tomorrow morning I'm going to tell you what's in your heart, when he told him, Saul seemed completely unaware that the greatness that was in him? Let me try it again. Did you notice that when Samuel said to him, you are called to be the ruler of Israel, and he said, this is already in your heart. It's like the Wizard of Oz. He didn't give him anything he didn't already have. Did you notice that the only, the person who was the clueless about his identity was the person who was called to be the king? He anoints him king, but did you also notice that he anointed the wrong man with the right word. Because then he said, you need to go over and meet these prophets, and when you do, you'll be changed into another man. How many know that Saul had to be changed into another man for the prophecy to be fulfilled? I'd suggest that he wasn't changed into a different man, but he was changed back into the man that he was supposed to be in the first place. That low self-esteem, disillusion, poor poor performance, all of those things reduce Saul to a man that even when he received the prophecy, he actually couldn't be what God wanted him to be until he encountered the prophets and he was changed into another man. I'm going to finish my prophecy. Would you stand? This is what I see. I see a community of worshipers who are carrying the seeds of greatness. And some of you have been carrying it for years. I heard some of the prophetic words today. It was amazing. Many of you have been carrying words that have never happened. And some of you think, you know, I I just don't know if I believe in prophecy anymore because they never happen. But I propose to you that until you meet your people, you can't come into your destiny. And I think that when you came here, see, we say this all the time. People come for the supernatural and they stay for the community. They stay for the family. I think that there are so many of you, you came here and people ask you what happened and you were actually changed into another man. You were changed into another woman. You were changed into the person that you were supposed to be in the first place so that all the prophetic words that you've been receiving for some of you since you were a child, you're carrying them around like in your purse or your wallet, and you're like, here's these seeds, they never grow. And I want to propose to you that you, you can... <laughs> Everyone's trying to find their purpose, and until you find your people, you can't find your purpose. Because your purpose is in your people. You are part of something bigger. How many know... The prayer is our Father who's in heaven, not my dad. How many know that if your your vision doesn't include other people, you don't have the Father's vision? Because the Father never gives you a vision that you can fulfill by yourself. So I want to pray for you right now. Because I believe that you came here for a worship school, but you found your people. And that the Lord's changed you. I feel like half this class has been changed into another person. And Lord, I I release right now this prophetic declaration that these people, they came to learn about worship, but they left knowing who they are. And Lord, I just release this prophetic declaration that even in the days of Saul, they came to Bethel to encounter the prophets and to be changed into another man. And Lord, I pray that every single person in here would have an unveiling, that they would have a new sense, not just of purpose, but of personhood. In Jesus' name. And I want you to say, I receive that for myself. I receive it for my children. I receive it for my children's children. 
in Jesus' name. God bless. Thank you very much.